Hello, can everyone hear me? Good, okay. Um, so I'm Matt Fishman, and probably a lot of you know Katie Hyatt. Um, I'm a data scientist at the Flatiron Institute, and I work on a package called iTensor, which is currently in C++, and Katie is a postdoc at the Flatiron Institute, and um, helping us out with the porting of the C++ package to Julia. Um, and so what our talk is going to be about is our process of moving iTensor to Julia. So the motivation for um, iTensor is that tensors are commonly used all over science and math, and iTensor is focused on a particular set of algorithms called tensor networks, which I will try to give a brief introduction to at the beginning of the talk. So tensors, as I think we all know, are everywhere. They use the machine learning. They can be used for function approximations um, as representations of large data sets and statistics. And the particular application of iTensor so far has been mostly focused on physics and chemistry, in particular quantum physics and quantum chemistry, although there's a, a bit of work now using it for machine learning. And so some examples of the kinds of things that we would want to apply tensor networks to in physics are studying high, high temperature superconductors, um, complicated chemical systems. This is a system of photosystem two, which tensor network techniques have been, have been used to, to study, which is important for photosynthesis. Um, and the simulation of quantum computers. We currently have a summer intern using our software to develop a um, quantum computer simulator. And so the, the, all you need to know, we, you don't need to know all this physics stuff for this talk. What you need to keep in mind is that we're working with really big tensors. And when you work with tensors on, with many, many dimensions, and when you work with tensors um, on a computer, there's the curse of dimensionality. So say that we start with the vector, so it has a single index, and say the dimension, is this a little cut off on the left side? Is this another new Mac? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hopefully I didn't put too many things on that very edge of the screen, but we'll see. <laughs> um, so if we have one dimension, which is two, we, we can think of this as a length two to the one vector. Um, now we have a, a matrix where all the dimensions are two. We have a two by two matrix, and so we have um, a length four vector on our computer. And then if we have an order three tensor, it's, say it's two by two by two, then we have eight elements that we have to store in our computer. And then we're actually looking at the limit where we have an infinite number of dimensions, which might be some small size two. They might be a large size as well. And of course, this becomes intractable to even store in a computer, let alone do any computations. Um, and we're going to use a, a nice notation that we really like in this talk, where we have a box which represents some order tensor. And then if we have a line out of it, it represents a dimension. So a box with one line is a vector. A box with two lines is a matrix. A box with three lines is an order three tensor. And then we can have some arbitrary number of lines coming out, and that represents an order n tensor. And so um, using this notation, we can represent linear algebra and multilinear algebra in a very compact way. So for example, um, matrix vector multiplication with Einstein summation notation is over here. And we can represent it diagrammatically, where if a line is connected, it means that we sum over that particular index. So since these, the single line of the vector is connected to one line of the matrix, we sum over that index, and the result is a vector with only one leg sticking out. Matrix times vector gives you a vector. So matrix multiplication can be written in this notation as well, where we sum over a single index, and then the result is another matrix, of course, a tensor with two legs. 
And then finally, we can represent something a bit more complicated like a trace. So a trace would be that both of the lines of the matrices are connected and therefore summed over. And this is equivalent to a trace, and we get a tensor with no legs sticking out. So it's a scalar, order zero tensor. Um, Any reason you just put double lines between the A and the B? You could do that too, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, for this talk, though, the directions of the lines don't matter, but they can matter in certain applications. Um, and then we can represent more complicated expressions like summing, contracting over three indices, or an order four tensor and an order five tensor, and getting an order three tensor as a result. Um, and so a tensor network is basically taking a very large tensor and splitting it up into a contraction of smaller tensors. So one example of this is things like the CPD or Tucker or higher order SVD. Um, and basically what that is is that you have a core tensor which is of a lower rank than your original tensor and then matrices on the dimensions and this can give you some sort of compression. Um, we use a, a different set of ansauces for various reasons which there's, there's many forms of tensor networks we take. The simplest one is the matrix product state or tensor train and we can make all sorts of nice networks out of these tensors and they're good for certain problems and not other problems. Um, and so a question is um, how do we actually code something like this sort of tensor contraction where we're contracting order three and order four tensors together on a computer? And so um, one thing that we can use is einsum, which is pretty popular in NumPy and there's some packages to do it already in, um, in Julia, so we could say using einsum, oh, yep, that's a problem. Maybe we could uh, escape out of the, yeah, okay. yeah, that's better. <laughs> so we can, <laughs> we can define um, all of our tensors as just regular Julia arrays, and then we can use einsum or uh, tensor operations where we'd put at tensor here, and what we have to do is list all of the, give all of the indices temporary labels which correspond to what we have in our head for what the first, and remembering that the first index is like the L index that I put a label on my diagram there. And so we actually find that this becomes pretty tedious for our own applications because all these li labels, you'd, for each new line of code, you'd have to rewrite all of the labels over and over. And so um, what we use instead is, um, so the problems with Lightsum are their memory um, layout independent operations. Um, you need to rewrite the indices over and over. Um, it can be hard to make algorithms for tensors with variable number of dimensions, which we, we have in our use cases. And so um, what we do in iTensor is we first define We'll just keep um, we first define the indices that are going to be involved in our contraction. Then we define our I tensors, which you can think of as labeled tensors, um, using those indices. And then to do the contraction, I tensor, the I tensor system automatically sees that two in indices are equal and therefore contracts over them automatically. And so then you can just use a simple notation where you just do a times L times M times R to contract this diagram and get your result B. And so um, with this notation you can make um, setting elements w of the tensor you can do in terms of indices where you set the indices to specified values and this, this you can do in any ordering. So you could do R of one and then L of one and so Things like setting elements become uh, memory independent. And then we do a lot of things where we do an SVD where we reshape a tensor into a matrix according to, say, some specified legs on the, that go onto the U matrix. 
And so we have some nice notation for specify, doing an SVD, treating this as a matrix, and then it does a bunch of, if you had to do this by hand in Julia, you'd have to do a bunch of permutations and reshapes, call the SVD function, then permute, reshape, and then permute back. It becomes really tedious. Um, and then in addition, addition, addition of tensors becomes easier because if you define tensors with the same indices, you can just add them together and our system will automatically um, handle the permutation of the data for you. And so we have um, a pretty active community, mostly of physicists who work on iTensor. Um, we have a pretty nice website with good documentation. A lot of physicists write and some machine learning people write papers using iTensor um, every year. And we have a pretty active support. Um, so um, we also have some high, higher level features that we want to port to Julia, like block sparse and diagonal tensors, um, matrix product states and matrix product operators, which are, you can think of as exponentially large vectors and matrices made up of smaller tensors. Um, we have some MPS um, eigenvector algorithms, so finding um, dominant eigenvectors of exponentially large matrices and vectors, um, and some convenient human-readable interfa interfaces for making physics models. And so um, the reason why we're in the process of moving away from C++ are a variety of reasons, which probably anyone who's used C++ is aware of. Um, <laughs> So the development time is slow. Um, our users don't like C++ in general, um, but they use it because our software is in C++. <laughs> it's difficult to include dependencies. So right now we only have the dependencies of BLAST and LAPAC. So the, the other main developer, Miles, made a lot of work to make sure that that was the case, just to make compiling the library easier. Um, so that means we have to write everything ourselves. So there's a built-in array class in iTensor. There's all the linear algebra wrappers. Um, we have a, a system of keyword arguments that we wrote, or I didn't write, but Miles wrote entirely himself in C++. Um, C++ has pretty ugly syntax, and it's difficult to get people to contribute quality code. Hi, everybody. So now I'm going to take over talking about our Julia port. Um, so one thing we wanted to emphasize about this, uh, the new iTensor's Julia package, is it's not a wrapper around the existing C++ code. It's a ground-up rewrite entirely in Julia, um, which is really nice because uh, if anybody's wrapped a C++ package in Julia, they know what an exciting adventure that is. Um, <laughs> and we were, like, looking for a more sedate Julia programming experience, um, so we just did a ground-up rewrite instead. Um, so there's a bunch of reasons we were interested in uh, creating an iTensors package in Julia using some of the features um, and lessons we've learned from the C++ version. One is multiple dispatch. Um, we have lots of different types of objects we want to do similar operations on. Um, the Julia package system is really nice, actually, uh, just for, like, getting our code to users or other people who want to develop it. Um, since uh, you might have noticed we're doing a lot of matrix vector, matrix matrix, or, like, matrix-like object operations, it's great that we have really good wrappers in Julia for dense and sparse linear algebra. Um, and we think, and in some cases know, that it's going to be easier to add really important features like parallelization, GPU support, or auto diff in Julia than it would have been in C++. Um, it's also, like, empirically been possible for us to have a lot of the same functionality in terms of, like, the API that's exposed to users with much less code on the back end, which is good because the maintenance surface and the amount of places we can have horrendous bugs is hopefully smaller. Um, from my own heart, uh, it's much easier to test the Julia code in terms of, like, how often you actually write tests in Julia. So, that's good, um, since probably anybody who's dealt with big physics software packages knows they don't get tested a lot. Um, <laughs> and the notation in Julia is really nice, um, which is just like a nice quality of life, th life thing to have. Um, we find it's easier to get contributors, hint, hint, if anybody wants to contribute. Um, and of course, Julia is fast, like we heard in the survey uh, response earlier, so it's not just us who thinks that. 
Um, so there are a couple pain points with Julia. Uh, there's a few things we are able to do in C++ that are kind of hard to do in Julia. Um, basically because we don't have real reference counting. Um, like there are a few copy on write and smart in place operations in C++ that would be nice to have, but we can kind of work around this. Um, just like translating between any two languages, it's sometimes right tough to find the proper idiom to really express what you want to do. Um, so an example of this is something that would be really nice for us to have in native Julia would be a mutable fixed sized array. Um, I know S and M arrays exist in the static arrays package, but that's not in Julia itself. Um, and then if you want to use MKL, doing it in the REPL is slow. It's kind of lame. Um, and then obviously this is getting better as time goes on, but uh, the startup and compile times are slow too. So, oh, that's sad. Um, so just to go and kind of like recapitulate a little bit some of the internal details of how iTensors work. Um, so each iTensor is kind of a little set of labeled indices uh, that sit on top of an opaque internal storage array. A little bit like how Cartesian indices work or any of the other multi-dimensional indexing support works in base Julia, if anybody has used that a bunch. Um, so to make an iTensor, I just define some indices, give them a size and a label, um, and then I can just build iTensors out of them. And you can see in, uh, hopefully you can see down here, that this iTensor A has a storage type, so it's a dense contiguous array whose elements are of type float64. Um, so one thing, that's nice about this is that if you're a developer, you can say, oh, well, I actually hate dense arrays, um, so I'm gonna just define my own internal storage type. Uh, and that means that you could do all kinds of different um, storage types, many of which we're developing right now, like obviously diagonal is one you might like, um, or I guess it's now called uniform scaling in Julia, um, things like block sparse support. This is really useful for quantum mechanical simulations. Um, Another thing we're developing that we're gonna talk about a little bit later in this talk is GPU support. So you can just basically re-implement the entire API very quickly on the GPU using this framework. Um, and there's a couple of more speculative things that we're thinking of doing. Um, full sparse support, uh, like some sort, of, sort of distributed arrays backend, really like basically any kind of array you can just jam in there and do weird stuff with. Um, and the nice thing is that it's really easy to swap out all these storage types in practice. Um, so that makes it easy for somebody to come in and just be like, here's my weird array type. Here's all the API for it. Um, I'm gonna now run bizarro, like mirror universe quantum mechanical simulations on this thing. And also machine learn on my weird anti-block sparse matrix. Um, so as I said, we're adding some GPU functionality and in fact, this is kind of working already. So we wanted to add fully tensor aware GPU support because as I already said, we're doing a lot of matrix matrix operations. I wonder if I could use the GPU to make this faster. Um, and indeed you can. Uh, so we were lucky because there was already a great package existing out in the wild that provided a lot of the GPU array functionality we wanted, which is coarrays.jl. Shout out to any of the coarrays developers who are here. Um, and some of the features we needed were stuff like just arrays existing at all in the GPU, but also broadcasting, random init, um, basic linear factorizations like QR and SVD and eigenvalues. Um, and then additionally, NVIDIA has developed this new QTensor library, which is I think publicly, publicly available, but you gotta register as a developer, which is like free to do. Um, and one thing that's cool about this is that just like iTensor, you can use labeled indices on a 1D GPU based array and it, using these labeled indices, it'll perform just elementary operations that you need, like adding, scaling, contract. If you're a machine learning person, like they have, you know, your basic like relus, um, sigma functions, things like that. Um, and so we've actually basically re-implemented most of the core iTensor API for these GPU arrays um, using the really nice modular design that Coarrays has. Um, so this actually took about two afternoons of work, um, including writing tests, uh, although it's not docked yet, so it's not like completely done. Um, and we can actually see like, okay, so I wanted to use the GPU because it was gonna make the tensor contractions faster. So did it actually do that? Or did I spend two hours for no purpose at all? Um, so first, uh, hopefully this is kind of legible. Um, we're creating, uh, we're gonna import the iTensors library and then the Ku iTensors submodule and then some benchmark tools because we wanna benchmark some stuff. Um, we're gonna create a bunch of big indices of size in like the hundreds. I could have cheated here and made these all powers of two, but I didn't. Um, I'm gonna create some indices, um, just four of them right now, give them the appropriate sizes, and then create some initial random tensors, um, both on the CPU and on the GPU. Uh, so if we just benchmark um, a contraction 
of two of these tensors on the CPU using benchmark tools, at least this bold showed up, you can see that the medium time to do this contraction um, over a bunch of samples on the CPU is about two seconds, and on the GPU it was about 44 uh, microseconds, oh, sorry, milliseconds, which is substantially faster, and that's really good because in almost all of the physics applications and also in the machine learning stuff we're doing, the vast majority of time we spend is in either doing tensor contractions or doing SVD. Um, so if you can dramatically increase the speed of doing contractions, I guess you can just spend more, more of your life doing SVD, but there's also a GPU implementation of that, so hopefully that'll be quicker too. Um, so there's a couple limitations of these GPU-based eye tensors. Uh, of course, everybody knows GPUs have pretty restricted memory space. Even if you spend a lot of money, uh, they have about 32 gigs of RAM on the device, um, which is kind of annoying for us because a lot of state-of-the-art tensor network algorithms require hundreds of gigabytes of RAM, so either you can't do state-of-the-art stuff or you have to spend a lot of time checkpointing, which will kill your performance because you're doing memory transfers. We don't have a multi-GPU implementation yet. Um, and you might have noticed on the previous slide, everything was prepended with KUs and CUDA. So right now, this whole implementation requires an NVIDIA GPU. Um, sorry, AMD fans out there. Uh, and this all performs best when all of the tensor operations take place on the GPU, again, because it minimizes memory transfer. And we also aren't using sort of on-device uh, stream parallelism yet. Um, that's another to-do. But even so, we still see a big performance gain, which is really great for us. Um, so some future directions for the project are to continue porting advanced iTensor features to Julia, like these state-of-the-art algorithms we mentioned, um, including these backends for diagonal and block sparse tensors, um, and improving the human-readable interface for physics models. Um, we want to just have more parallel support at all levels, including better GPU support. Um, we want to uh, integrate automatic differentiation, which is useful not only for the machine learning stuff, but also for a bunch of the physics research we do. Um, and incorporate other uh, contraction acceleration backends like GETT, and then also support uh, distributed tensor storage. Um, so if you're interested in the project, uh, check out this newly public github.com slash itensor, itensors.jl. I have to give you a big caveat right here, which is that this is like very alpha software, um, so please don't make fun of us uh, if you read the repo, or at least like do so in a gentle way. Um, and we also really want to thank Mal Studenmeyer, who has been working with us and supervising us at the Flatiron Institute, um, and Steve White of UC Irvine, who was both the progenitor of the DMRG algorithm and one of the main contributors to iTensor, um, and our mutual employer, the Simons Foundation, um, and Julia for being awesome. So, thank you. <laughs> Questions? So we have time for questions. I think in the interest of everyone being able to hear and also if we're still streaming on YouTube, it would be really helpful if questions were asked into the microphone. And I don't think I can take this mic off of the stand. So you're going to need to come up here, please, uh, if you'd like to ask a question. So come on up. That incomprehensible, huh? <laughs> I, I have a question for you. So you mentioned um, a number of things that you would continue, like to continue working on. Um, what of these uh, future directions do you think uh, will help bring in more Julia users to the community? Uh, I would say, uh, and Matt can answer this too if, if he wants, but um, just like integrating more support for the stuff machine learning people are using, because people are using Tencent Networks to do machine learning right now, um, and like on a purely numerical basis, there's probably more people into machine learning than are into like condensed matter physics, um, as sad as it might make me. Um, so probably working on the GPU support and the auto diff, uh, things like that. Um, yeah, that. we would also like to, on top of auto diff and GPU support, we want to make the interface, the interfaces and just the functions available are a little bit biased towards physics right now. So one of our larger goals is to add functionality that would be more useful for other applications like machine learning. Uh, what, what was your experience benchmarking against other uh, tensor packages when it came to uh, contractions and, uh, sorry, not only contractions but other operations? Um, so mostly what we've done is just benchmark against our own C++ implementation and we found that 
I think right now, like for high level functions like DMRG, which is this large eigensolver, it was within like 20% of the speed of C++, which we're very happy with considering how new the, the package is. Um, and just some quick benchmarking. It all, I mean, a lot of the, a lot of the um, contractions are actually just blast limited. So we would be surprised if they were much slower. But um, things like permutations can also take quite a long time, and that seems to be pretty good in Julia right now. I was going to ask, do you have any sort of BLAST 3-like transformations or, or uh, algorithms written in Julia, or do you rely on libraries to do all those kinds of uh, tiling, et cetera, uh, optimizations? Yeah, we just use, like, BLAST, but um, I, it would be nice to work on other backends, but yeah. Uh, when you do an SVD, what... Uh, indices does the interior dimensions end up with? Does it just generate random names for them, or how does that work? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so it does generate new random um, indices. You can give them certain labels. The index objects are actually kind of complicated, and they have a lot of information in them. And so those have to be generated randomly. But you can you can grab them and then use them later. All right, let's thank our speakers again. So